All right. Today, super pumped to have a fellow physician and uh, former Navy SEAL who may be, you know, you may not predict that this guy would be such a savant with respect to sleep and have that be a focus of his being of the both Navy SEAL background and a physician. I at least from my background as a physician, we never valued sleep, right? Every moment you were sleeping was literally a moment you were missing something, maybe a new, you know, ER case or some kind of a surgical procedure. Like we did not value sleep when I did my training and, and doctor <laughs> today we have Dr. Kirk Parsley on with us and he's, he's at least a couple years older than I am. And when he did his training, I'm sure he didn't value sleep either. So I'm interested, Dr. Parsley, how did you get involved with sleep? How did it become not only of interest, but a passion for yours being both a former Navy SEAL and a physician? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you took the words right out of my mouth, man. I, I say that all the time. I probably, I probably chose the two worst professions in the world, uh, for somebody <laughs> was... who cares about sleep. Right. Uh, <laughs> You know, SEAL, SEAL training, we spend an entire week without sleep just to prove we can do it. And then, you know, when you're when you're in the SEAL teams and there's work to be done, you know, no sleep for two or three days was very common. And if you slept, it just meant you were weak and you didn't really care that much. And, you know, we, we probably want you out of the platoon because you're, you know, you're a guy we can't really count on because you have to sleep like a weakling, you know. Um, <laughs> and like you say, of course, meta, you know, medical training exactly the same way starts in it really starts in academics, right? Because the, the first two years, you're either sleeping or studying or worrying about not studying or, uh, right? Those are like your <laughs> your three states. And so, and then of course the hospitals and residencies, like all that, like nobody, uh, again, it's like, you're obviously not that interested in the training if you need to sleep or, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, well, you know, interestingly enough, I think like, uh, I think like a lot of passions in the world, like, it, it wasn't something that I developed. It was something that's kind of foisted upon me. You know, I, uh, so as you said, I was, I was a Navy SEAL, like right out of high school. Um, I, I actually, uh, didn't even come close to graduating high school. Uh, and I, I dropped out of high school, got a GED and joined the Navy to be a SEAL. And I, I mean, I only knew what a SEAL was for about, uh, two or three weeks before I joined the Navy. <laughs> like I, there was some uh, video documentary that came out on SEAL training and how it was the toughest training in the world. And I was like, I want to do that. You know, cause like I was, I was a fairly good athlete growing up. I, I was a, a good power athlete. I should say I, I, I was strong and fast and big and aggressive and, uh, and uh, you know, had a lot of determination. And so I was like, I want to go do the toughest thing. Um, and I always kind of knew I'd go in the military cause that's just kind of my family's values. Um, and so I, you know, I went and I went into the SEAL teams, uh, you know, I joined the Navy, went through SEAL training, obviously made it through. And then I, I did, uh, you know, that was like during, uh, and we, we had the first Gulf war during that, but, you know, like, I think we sent like one or two SEAL platoons over very limited skirmish, you know, a few bullets fired. Like I, so, um, you know, that was, that was kind of like one and done and the kind of the, the feeling was that we're never going to really go to war again. You know, like, you know, the, like everything's gotten too technologically advanced. Doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, it, um, and so, you know, it was just kind of redundant. It was the same training trips over and over again. And all we really did was go over to foreign countries on our deployments and like train their militaries. I do a little bit of police work here and there essentially. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I'd met a woman. I was you know, like, fall at fell in love. I was going to get married. And so, Figured, you know, not very, very rarely were SEALs married in those days. Um, and, and uh, you know, figured it's a young single man's job. I'm becoming neither. I'm going to go do something else. Uh, but being a <laughs> high school dropout and a dude who got like D's and F's starting in third grade, um, I had no real serious academic ambitions. You know, I thought maybe I'd be an athletic trainer or something like that. Um, but then I, you know, I started college and, surprisingly did very well. And, uh, I, I thought it might be a physical therapist and I started volunteering to get, you have, you know, I don't know if you know this, you have to have 2000 volunteer hours just to apply to PT school. And so wow, I was like, wow, I better get, I better get started on that. You know, cause that's like, <laughs> that's uh two, that's two years of part-time work. You have like 20 hours a week. Right. Uh, and so I, you know, I started volunteering at San Diego sports medicine center. Um, by the way, I went to UCSD as well. I read that you were, you went yeah, to UCSD med school. Yeah, I, I went Triton. to UCSD undergrad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. um, 
And so I, I was working at San Diego Sports Medicine Center, uh, which was owned by Lee Rice. I don't know if you know him as a DO, but he kind of managed all the professional teams and college teams uh, there. And, uh, you know, I pretty quickly decided I didn't want to be a PT. Like uh, they hired me on as a PT assistant and like probably a week or two after I got into it, which would be the same as the volunteer hours. And I was like, I don't really think I want to do this. And then, you know, some of the doctors there, like, tried to talk me into going to medical school. And I was like, whoa, you know, pump the brakes, Sparky. Like, I, like I, you know, I have a GED. I like, guess be serious, right? And, uh, and, and the head, the head, Lee Rice, the owner of the clinic comes out and he, he overhears this conversation. Uh, cause the doctors I'm talking to, cause I'd already been a SEAL, you know, and, and, uh, um, they were only like two or three years older than me, you know, cause they had gone to college yeah. medical school and then this, and I, you know, gone from high school to the SEAL teams and, you know, that was seven years. And then I'd started college and it's a year or so. And, uh, so they were, he overhears the conversation. He comes out and he says, Kirk, the question isn't, uh, can you get into medical school? The question is, would you go if you got in? And I was like, of course I'd go if I got in. And he goes, well, then you have to try, don't you? Right. So he kind of, he kind of guilts me into Jedi mind tricks me into it. I'm like, all right, you're right. So, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I started at Grossmont college and I transferred to UCSD. Uh, anyway, obviously got into medical school. I didn't even know the military had their own medical school. Like the military was kind of like a done chapter in my life. Uh, but when I went to apply for medical schools, you remember back then before the internet, you went and got the, yeah, uh, you had Kaplan to do all the paper. Over, yeah. You looked at your GPA <laughs> and MCAT and figured out where you're competitive. And, uh, and I found, Hey, the military is a medical school. I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> and they'll pay me to go to medical school. And like, I was already married. I already had a kid. I was like, Ah, that makes sense. And then I figure, you know, I'll, I'll get back to the SEAL teams. I'll get back to that community that really shaped me as a man and like, you know, kept me from definitely improved my life, uh, uh, completely, completely transformed my life. And so I was like, yeah, I'll go give back to the community. And so, uh, you know, all through medical school, uh, uh, internship, the way, the way the Navy gets, keeps general practitioners is they let you do one year of residency and then they send you out to the fleet for a couple of years and then you get to come back and finish. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. so everything I, you know, everything I thought of and prepped for was only sports medicine and ortho. Like that was the only thing I was really interested in. Um, so when I got to the seal teams, they had just funded this, uh, they just gotten their funding, you know, the way military works, it takes like 10 years to get the funding for the project. They just gotten this funding and they're like, we're going to build a rehab facility here on our compound, which most people would have thought we'd already have, but we don't, <laughs> you know, so we, uh, <laughs> guys have to go over the bridge back and forth to Balboa hospital. And so, mm. um, so they put me in charge of building this thing out, which was a perfect fit, given my background. Right. And so. I supervised the build out of this clinic and we hired our first strength and conditioning coach and we hired our first athletic trainer and our physical therapist and PT assistants. Uh, we brought in acupuncturist. Uh, we had ortho rounds coming through and pain rounds coming through. And then I was the dumbest dude around at that point, right? Because <laughs> we had all the specialists. And, <laughs> yeah. And we, and, and we got great guys. Like we got guys from professional sports teams and like high, you know, D one colleges and like, Olympic training center, like all these really amazing, uh, employees. Uh, and so in the military, when you're the dumbest guy around, they put you in charge and they say like, you supervise. <laughs> right. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to supervise. I, I don't know how you supervise people who know more than you about their job, but I guess that's something the world does. So, um, so my office was in this rehab facility and, uh, seals are a lot like professional athletes and that, um, the worst thing that you can do to them is take them out of their job, right? Like put them, put them on the bench is way, way worse than anything else. Worse than getting shot, worse than like that to them is failure. Um, and so doctors are the primary people who disqualify them. Like you have yeah. this problem that needs to be dealt with. So, you know, you need to come out and deal with this and it, you know, be six months, nine months, we will get you back to work. And so they just lie to their doctors uh and they just they don't tell them what's going on and then they go out into town and they find a physician who work with them and they pay them cash and they get their problems handled 
Um, but because I'd been a SEAL and I'd been a SEAL recently enough to where there, there were still a ton of SEALs at the team on the West Coast there that that I had been a SEAL with. I'd gone through training with, I'd deployed with. And uh, I obviously had a good enough reputation to where people trusted me and they'd come, they came to my office and they just started listing out this litany of problems. Um, and the first guy comes in and is like, hey, you know, kind of hush, hush, shuts the door behind him and says, hey, let me tell you what's really going on, right? Uh, and he's basically like, my motivation sucks. My concentration sucks. I can't remember anything. I feel tired all the time. I'm grouchy. I snap at my wife. I snap at my kids. I'm getting fatter. I'm getting weaker. I'm doing everything they're telling me to do, everything the nutritionist is telling me to do, everything the strength and conditioning coach is telling me to do. And I'm just getting worse. And I, my motivation sucks. And again, that's that seal standard of motivation, right? Like they're still yeah. going out and doing their job, but, um, with, you know, they don't feel like it. It's a grind. It's harder. Everything aches. Um, and then they'd be like, you know, but maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just getting old doc. Right. And I'd be like, yeah, I mean, you're 28. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's over. Dude. <laughs> it's <laughs> over. You're 28. <laughs> and so anyway, um, I mean, you, you can put yourself in that, sp in that spot a few years after medical school is like, I had no idea, right? Because they didn't have, I mean, they didn't have any diseases. That's what I learned in medical school. Like <laughs> that when you see this and that, that's a disease and this is how you treat it. They don't have any disease. They just aren't performing as well as they would like. And I was like, I don't know. So like, let me test everything. So I would just, I basically just shotgunned everything I could possibly test in serum to go to the hospital and do this. Uh, took these long histories, talked to these guys for hours. And I was thinking, you know, like uh, you had heard like combat fatigue and shell shock and stuff from old from other wars. And this was 2009. So they'd been in combat for eight years. I'm like, maybe we're starting to see some of that. Um, and I started fitting around with what, you know, there was this, it, you know, you probably remember uh, around that time, there was this, uh, this big push around this adrenal fatigue syndrome and like, well, maybe it's that. And so like, I was trying to like, treat people and and their core their cortisol levels like you know their the their adrenal hormones were off you know and but their sex hormones were off like all their anabolic hormones basically everything anabolic was low and everything catabolic was high like that's the simplest way <laughs> to think about it yeah and i and i was just like i i don't really know but because i'd listened to because they trusted me i already had like a hundred guys counting on me because they just all you know they they tell two friends, they tell two friends. And the next thing you know, I, I just have like this file cabinet full of guys. That I'm like, I don't know. And, you know, and, and the military was, you know, they're not a liberal organization they're not progressive. They weren't it, like, they were totally down on me, like giving Myers cocktails or something. Like I thought me, <laughs> like I'd given guys Myers cocktails. And I, I mean, you would have thought that uh, I'd sold, uh, classified information to the enemies or something like to crack down on me for <laughs> doing this voodoo medicine. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, Whoa. Um, but you know, I was going to get, I was going to figure it out. Um, and I don't know, I can't remember how far in, but it, I, it was a lot of guys who had talked to me before, uh, this light bulb went off on my head when I was interviewing, uh, cause the guy said he takes Ambien. Um, I don't even think he said like how much, how often or anything. Mm -hmm. He just kind of didn't mention it. And I was like, Huh, it seems like a lot of guys say that. And I kind of remember making a note in the margin. And when he left, I went back and checked my files. And every single guy who had been in my office was taking Ambien. Well, and I was uh, like, oh, well, that's interesting. And, you know, you you went through medical school like I did. What I knew about Ambien was not much. You know, I learned about it <laughs> in pharmacology class. It was a GABA analog. It helped you sleep. That's what I, that's about what I knew. And like, what did you learn about sleep in medical school? Like, yeah, you know, we specifically were told we know that you have to sleep, but we don't know why. Like we were told that right. we can't tell you why. We know what happens when you don't, but we can't tell right. you why. And I, and I think the why wasn't discovered till 2012 with the folks out of the University of Rochester that discovered the glymphatic system and all the sort of you know toxin flush and all the things that happen at night while we sleep. That wasn't even known when you and I were in medical school. So I guess you know, right? We we, we can, <laughs> yeah, have an excuse because so, so we didn't know. We didn't know. <laughs> yeah so the so the fortunate thing that had happened was right around that time i can't remember if it was ambien or lunesta or like which which z drug it was mm -hmm. one of the z drugs was had like a class action lawsuit against it 
and you know when that that's the only time you really get to see pharma's research right because when they go to court they have to give it all up they have to lift up the mm -hmm. kimono and say here's all the research right and so they knew it like they knew that it was just a dissociative and that it didn't help with sleep like the best data they cherry picked was like you fell asleep 13 13 minutes faster and slept for 37 minutes longer but 80 percent of rem sleep was gone and 20 percent of deep sleep was gone so it was a net mm -hmm. negative for yeah. sure <laughs> and then uh it, you know but i knew nothing about sleep so when i started reading about what was going on with them i learned you know about the different phases of sleep and you know what's going on in deep sleep versus rem and like you talked about uh glymphatic flow and all that stuff and i was like oh, okay this could actually explain every symptom they have right because you know in deep sleep you're re-regulating like all your anabolic hormones are being regulated mm -hmm. during deep sleep right and you know their anabolic hormones are off and then their cortisol is like a response to how well they're sleeping and cortisol is at its lowest in deep sleep and it eventually wakes you up and if you mm -hmm. don't sleep well you compensate by increasing your cortisol production and so like okay all this is maybe making a lot of sense and so uh of course being seals you know one is good two is great three is fantastic uh and then you know chase that down with a couple of cocktails <laughs> uh and i learned I also learned like researching this and and the one really good thing I had going for me was uh the seals were already pretty notorious by the time they already had a lot of um they're kind of media darlings at that point and uh though so i could call anybody i, I mean why i watched somebody's ted talk i read somebody's book i can just call them and say hey my name's my name's kirk parsley i'm the doctor for the west coast seal teams uh i read your book i saw you lecture whatever can i really like, can i consult you know, can I ask you questions, can I come train with you? And everybody was super helpful. Um, nobody, nobody even suggested charging me for it. They were all just like very, very, very generous with their time. And so I got to learn a lot really quickly. Um, you know, and I learned that well, alcohol decreases uh deep sleep or yeah, decreases uh, slow wave sleep, deep sleep by 80% and REM by 20%, and Z drugs do the opposite. So that explained every single sleep study that I did with all of my SEALs. They came back 99.9% .9 stage two sleep. And once I learned a lot about sleep, I didn't even know how they were surviving, right? Like you think yeah. about this, like how do you do that for three or four years and still be alive? Much less yeah. to be operating as a SEAL. <laughs> and stage um, two sleep, for those that don't know, it's basically like you're kind of half awake daydreaming. I mean, it is not deep, yeah. restful in any way. <laughs> I mean, it's like you're no, it's, it's, it, daydreaming. It's a transition you a phase. <laughs> it's like getting you ready. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a transition phase. It's like getting you ready for whichever stage yeah. is next, you know? Um, oh, man. And so we had these. Uh, so anyway, I I got, I said, well, we need to get everybody off of Ambien. And uh, <laughs> of course, they were taking Ambien because they couldn't sleep, right? So yeah. I just did a bunch of research and i was like okay what supplements actually help with sleep right um because the other thing is i was very limited to what i could give these guys because if you give them a pharmaceutical that they depend on then they're, they're disqualified because they get out in the field they don't have it and they're disabled you know they're you know if they're at all diminished because they can't get their medication then their liability so i had to do everything with like nutrition and lifestyle right and so i i just I did a bunch of research on things that help you sleep and I kind of figured out why all those things mattered. And then I came up with a concoction of like seven different things. And I, I gave them a handout and said, Hey, go buy all this stuff. Uh, and then with their feedback over the course of about six months, we kind of dialed in like what was the best brand and what was the right dosage for all of this. And, uh, and then, and the seals just started calling it, uh, Doc Parsley's, uh, sleep cocktail. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the military and you have any medical training, you're a doc, whether you have eight weeks of training or 80 years of training, you're just a doc, you know? And uh, so it's doc parsley and it was just the cocktails. Like it's a cocktail of medicines. Right. <laughs> um, and so, but so I got every, I successfully got everybody off of Ambien and lo and behold, when I did testosterone tripled free testosterone quadrupled like you know their their cortisol curves normal now their thyroid function re-regulated all you know their hscrp went down homocysteine went down like they, and they started looking like metabolically healthy young men you know i was seeing guys with six-pack abs with the fasting insulin of nine and i was like what oh <laughs> you know, like, this what? Is making sense. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, like you get people sleeping and it was just magic. And I, I literally got laughed out of leadership offices when I was telling them, Hey, our guys, hormones are off because of sleep. They're not sleeping well and hormones are right. And they, they literally laughed at me and like said, doc, you need to go back to med school. That's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> like, all right. But, um, but what we did in the SEAL teams is before a team deployed, we would uh, rent out a resort and we'd take the SEALs there with their families. And, um, and we would, you know, give them a bunch of lectures and workshops and courses and things to like help them and their families prepare for this six to nine month separation and what they're both going to be dealing with and what resources they had available to them, emergency lines, all this. And we would bring in guest speakers who the community was interested in to kind of drive motivation for this thing right uh and so we brought in guys like rob wolf and we brought in uh john wellborn and we brought in uh colonel grossman who you know the psychology wrote on killing and you know we had whatever cresser kind of the usual all everybody with the new york times best-selling book basically was in there uh usually associated with kind of the paleo sphere crossfit or some kind of mm. you know some kind of fitness um whatever um or fitness psychology mindset stuff and uh because because i the navy had me for free i like i did all the symposiums and, and uh, i got to know all these guys and i was pretty much the only guy talking about sleep back then and uh mm. and they were just saying man your work's really fascinating you know it's, especially rob because rob's lecture at that time was about two-thirds nutrition and one-third sleep and yeah. my lecture was exactly the opposite it's two-thirds about sleep and i ended up with a bunch of talk about new about nutrition and so, uh, you know, they, these guys just started inviting me to do symposiums with them, inviting me onto their podcast. And then by the time I got out, I was the sleep guy, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm really a performance guy, right? Like I'm, I'm like my private clients, I do everything with, I don't care what your performance goals are, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, 80% of it's lifestyle, as you know, so yeah. it's like oh, for sleep, sure. nutrition, sleep, nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation, I do all of that. And then, you know, I work with hormones. I work with peptides. I do some regenerative stuff. I do hyperbarics, you know, like all, like whatever I can do to improve people's performance. And so like my real work and my real passion is performance. I don't really deal with the disease people. Like, uh, you know, I, I man, like my, some of my clients have diseases like diabetes or something, but, um, by and large, like, I'm just, what are your goals? And like, we set annual goals, we set quarterly goals and I don't care what they are our cognitive, emotional, physical, weight loss, strength, speed, endurance. I don't care. And, and, uh, so I'm like, I really specialize in performance, but I'm the sleep guy to 90% of the people who ever heard my name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's super interesting because you're exactly right. Sleep was definitely not really talked about, not just throughout our medical training, but even beyond that. And in fact, like I said, this research that came out with the glymphatic system out of the University of Rochester, that was 2012. So that was just 11 years ago when we finally knew physiologically what actually happens when you sleep. We right. knew we had to, we just didn't know what was happening. And now you kind of have this, you know, real hard, you know, kind of scientific method proof that, okay, this is why we need to sleep. We need to flush out all these toxins, whether it be beta amyloid, tau yeah. protein, like whatever these things are that accumulate yeah. during the day. And when we don't do that, this is why we have all these performance issues, both cognitive, physical, emotional, you know, all these kinds of things. And so we have right. even more of this kind of, you know, basis for saying this is why sleep is important. And you mentioned Rob Wolf. He he was on our show, I think about two years ago or a year and a half ago. And and we, I think when we chatted, we probably didn't talk about sleep at all. <laughs> You're right. I mean, it's yeah, more like yeah. diet and you know, what we're fueling our body and whether, you know, these kinds of things. Maybe we talked, you know, for two minutes about getting some daylight in the morning to kind of set our circadian rhythm or something like that. But we didn't right. really talk much about sleep. I'd like to just backpedal a little bit to what you were saying about hormones and why sleep is so important with respect to hormones, because you mentioned a couple of them. You mentioned testosterone, growth hormone, um, insulin, yep. uh, thyroid right. hormone, um, also the ones that Lef we- Leptin, ghrelin. Ghrelin yeah. and leptin in the GLP-1A yeah. analogs. These yeah, things yeah. actually get regulated primarily while we sleep. And if we're not sleeping, all, all heck breaks loose. And right. We have the cravings that we might not have had. In fact, 
I, I can't remember where, where this was, but about uh, six or eight years ago, there was a study looking at sleep de deprived folks and how not only do their leptin levels go off, their ghrelin goes way up and they have all this hunger and they want to seek out you know, the hyper palatable foods that are probably already available because they make up 60 plus percent of our diet, sadly. But what's interesting is they become somehow become even more desired when we don't sleep. And this is, you know, a lot of us, I think over the, uh, you and I, I think we're trained this way. We always thought it was this, you know, you're being weak. If you can't just like avoid the candy or the, this or the, that, like you're just weak, <laughs> you know, this is just your right. problem. Like you got to just be tough and right. just put that aside. But what we've found is that when you sleep, these hormones get regulated and they can help us to not have these issues with craving. So maybe you could speak a little bit more about how that works. I'd love to hear your take on that. Yeah. So, I mean, so something, you know, something that, that I, I mean, I say, I say this matter of factly, it's, <laughs> it's really sort of my hypothesis, but there's a, I mean, there's a ton of supportive literature for this concept. It's probably just not as cut and dry as I want to say it, but, mm -hmm. um, really the only anabolic time of your life is while you're sleeping, right? If you think about uh, fight or flight is maximum stress hormones, yeah. right? Stress hormones are catabolic and yep. that's maximally catabolic. So the highest your stress hormones will ever be is when somebody's shooting at you with a gun or you're getting a fist fight <laughs> or car crash or something like that. Like yeah. fight or flight, nothing matters except getting away from that risk so your body will use every resource you have to get out of that situation it doesn't matter if you can fight off infection it doesn't matter if you can remember your phone number it doesn't matter if you can digest food or reproduce or none of that matters it's like you just got to get out of that situation now interestingly the exact opposite of fight or flight is slow wave sleep so when you get down into delta and theta those are that is the lowest cortisol you will have in any 24 hour period it's during your first phase of sleep like your your first sleep cycle and that and you know which you know is like 80 percent deep sleep and so obviously you're you know you're kind of cortisol stress hormones weight promoting neurotransmitters all kind of have to be at a certain level for you to be able to fall asleep and then they plummet as soon as you get down into deep sleep and that's when all of your anabolic upregulation happens so when you think about it like Anything you want to get better at, you actually get better at while you're sleeping. So when you go to the gym, if you do anything worth doing, you walk out of the gym weaker than you went into the gym, right? When do yeah. you get stronger? You get stronger when you go to bed, right? So you go to bed, you go to sleep, and your brain, use, your brain uses today as the template to figure out what you need to be better at tomorrow, right? So the you know, a very simplified way of saying it is like your brain and body are using today as a template to figure out what you need to be able to do tomorrow. So the whole point of me sleeping today is to repair everything that I damaged or overused and then prepare by replenishing whatever nutrients, resources, hormones, weight promoting, whatever, neuropeptides, neuro, uh, uh, neurotransmitters, whatever, like all, everything is going to be re-regulated while I sleep. And if I could repair a hundred percent and prepare a hundred percent, I would wake up exactly the same every day and I would never age. Right. So the <laughs> yeah, fact yeah. that I can't repair and prepare a hundred percent means that I age when I'm, when you're a kid, obviously you do. And you obviously we sleep longer and you sleep yeah. 10, 12 hours as a kid and you wake up taller and stronger and smarter and faster. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and then that plateaus like between somewhere around 25 to 35 and then it starts going the other way and you wake up a little diminished every day. <laughs> so if you choose to sleep six hours instead of the eight hours that's required, and that's a contract you're born into, you don't get to negotiate it. I mean, it's like <laughs> you're born into the fact that you're going to die and it takes eight hours to recover from being awake for 16 hours. That's just the way it goes, man. Fight it all you want, put all the butter in and coffee in the world and it's not going to, it's not going to change that. So. <laughs> You know, you you it you you go to sleep. Obviously, when you go into deep sleep, we talked about that. The lymphatics, that's when the astrocytes, glial cells all contract, create that mm -hmm. lymphatic flow. You flush out waste products there and everywhere else, right? Every organ in your body has a circadian rhythm. They're all doing different work. They're doing the repair and replenish stuff at night while you're sleeping. And then your all of your all of those feedback loops for your hormones, that's when those are all super tightly regulated. And so 
you know, anabolic hormones, testosterone, growth hormone, even DHEA, DHT, like all of all of that's being re-regulated. Um, thyroid hormone, of course, insulin sensitivity is being regulated mm-hmm. during that time. As we talked about leptin, ghrelin. So these are appetite regulators. Now, if I choose to sleep less than eight hours, let's say I choose six hours. I've just chosen to age 25% faster, right? Because we just said that if I could repair 100%, I wouldn't age. So I'm like, hell with that. I want to go, I want to go 25% faster. And what do we know about chronic insomniacs? They die 12, 14 years younger, right? Shift workers die 12 to 15, 14 years younger. Chronic ambient use, 12 to 14 years younger. So are you frozen? Oh, you are. Can you hear me? Got you back. Can you hear me? Green just went a little. Yeah, yeah. I can. I can see this. Okay. But go ahead. The, okay. Basically, um, you can't. You can't fight that simple truth of the eight-hour thing. Keep going back with that, and how you you die younger if you sleep less, and all these kinds of things. Keep going right. with that. And and then and then we know once we transition from from deep sleep to REM sleep, that's when you're going to rehearse everything you learned today, everything you thought about, every idea you had, every emotional experience you have, and you're going to figure out what information is important, and you're going to link new information to it and form durable pathways to things that are important, prune off stuff that's not important, and you're going to emotionally categorize things. So if you had a fight with your wife about dirty dishes, that goes in the waste <laughs> bin when you're asleep, right? If you don't sleep well, maybe that gets filed up like somewhere between a, a near assault or something. Like that's a big issue because you didn't recat- you didn't categorize it well. And this is one of the things we think happens with PTSD because people don't sleep well after PTSD. They don't emotionally categorize well. So anyway, you can think of it as like uh, deep sleep is anabolic for the body, re- you know, repairing for the body. REM sleep is sort of anabolic for the brain. And the other thing that uh, and again, this is just Doc Parsley theory, but the only time any animal on this planet sleep deprives themselves other than humans is when they're starving. So they want to be able to wake up earlier, forge further, go to sleep later, uh, or if they're being preyed upon, right? And if they're being preyed upon, what do they have more of? They have more stress hormones. If they're starving, mm-hmm. what do they have more? They have more stress hormones. And if you don't, and you know, and if the whole point of me going to sleep tonight is repairing and preparing for tomorrow, and I choose to cut it short by twenty five percent, tomorrow still comes at exactly the same time. <laughs> what do I do? How do I compensate? I compensate with stress hormones. So just like I'm like in a more dangerous environment, stress hormones keep you alert in proportion to your environment, and so my body's like, hey, things are a little more stressful, and it's very rational to think that there's some evolutionary, you know mechanisms in our brain to to react as though we're starving or we're being preyed upon because we're short sleeping if we aren't getting enough sleep why why because there's probably danger around and so we can measure that your stress hormones go up and one of the big things like you talked about the willpower that we that we think of um where does that come from prefrontal cortex all executive functioning coming from the prefrontal cortex all your decision making skills whether or not somebody looks threatening to you, whether or not somebody is being friendly or offensive to you, like all that's being processed in your prefrontal cortex. And that's the primary region of your brain that's the most affected by stress hormones. And that's why when I when I hear about all these kids being diagnosed with ADHD and you have kids that need nine to 12 hours of sleep every night and they're getting five or six hours. And I'm like, (laughs) you got to sleep adapt that kid before you can diagnose them with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the symptoms of ADHD and chronic sleep deprivation, tell me the difference. There's no difference at all between those. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if you don't get good quality of sleep and, and, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't bear bear out exactly. I know you know. I, I've checked out your website. I know you know quite a bit about sleep, so you know this isn't exact. But there, but there is a trend towards going to bed later and losing deep sleep and waking up too mm-hmm. early and losing REM mm-hmm. sleep. So you can kind of predict like what mess you're getting yourself into uh, through through that. Now, of course, you get so chronically de- sleep deprived and your circadian rhythms get it all off. Then who knows? You might fall asleep and be in deep sleep within five seconds. You know, um, but you know, as as a general rule. And so if if you're not getting that good deep sleep in the beginning of the night and ironically, I, well, I don't think ironically, um, 
for reasons I think I understand, the, the seals would usually go to sleep just fine. They just had terminal insomnia, right? Or maintenance insomnia. So they might wake up, you know, in the uh, three, four o'clock in the morning and not be able to go back to sleep. That's, and I'm frozen again. Can you, can you still have me? Okay. Um, the screen, there you go. Um, I got all that. I could hear all that. But yeah, you were saying they have terminal insomnia, the Marines. And so they most of them could fall asleep, but then towards the end, they just couldn't stay asleep. They couldn't continue yeah, that uh, and my, cycling through. And my, post, my, yeah, my postulate on that is uh, because they're very physically active and they're mm -hmm. big muscular men. Um, obviously, you know, you take uh, even a small woman and a large man, like what's the difference in the size of the brain? Like 10%, maybe 20%, like yeah, not 10, much, 15%. Like the yeah. brains don't like brains aren't that much difference in size, but if you have 30, 40% more muscle mass, you're producing way more adenosine and adenosine is what's causing the sleep pressure. Right. So I find mm -hmm. that like fit muscular men usually, usually go to sleep quite well. They have a lot of sleep pressure. Okay. And if they're really stressed out, they'll wake up after one sleep cycle because they've had the gonfladix flush they've converted a bunch of their mm -hmm. density back to atp now their stress hormones are high enough to wake them up because we know like if you stay awake for 48 hours 72 hours like you know all the stress hormones in the world aren't going to keep you awake you know, like you're like you're you're every every neuron on your body's bathed in adenosine and you're like you can you yeah. can sleep on rocks and cactus and feel comfortable you know Are you back with us, Kirk? I don't, I don't know what happened there, but we're uh, <laughs> okay. We we're should back. still be, yeah, we should still be recording and we can splice all this back together. I, okay. I don't know what happened there, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to back. give you such an editing job. I, yeah, I think no, it, no, no, I think worries. it's me because I'm, a, I'm like, I'm surrounded by thousands of acres of ranch land and I'm just kind of out in the okay. sticks and, and I have uh, satellite or cellular. <laughs> Those are my two internet choices oh, and they just okay. kind of. They vary. I understand like one's good that. One yeah. day and yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I understand that problem. Most of the places we live in the world are rural, and we fight that all the time. But I, I was speaking to I in my younger self. I used to think I could outsmart sleep. I I thought I could survive perfectly well off of four yep. to six hours of sleep, and yep. that was it. I just I didn't you know. And, and what's interesting is, like you said, you can't game the system this way. You can you think that you can, and maybe you can kind of operate but what i noticed after a couple of decades of this <laughs> is that yeah i wasn't thriving i was surviving sure i could do survival right. mode all day long i had i'm sure my cortisol levels were through the roof uh when i needed yeah. them to be and i actually the, one of the first things i noticed was i was starting to have the signs of insulin resistance my fasting blood sugar was creeping up and I was like late thirties, early forties. And, you know, I was just doing routine blood work, you know, every couple of years. And I was like, how in the heck could my fasting glucose be a hundred? That doesn't even right. make sense. Like I'm a thin right. fit, muscular guy. I got like 2% body fat. Like, how is that even possible? And it, it took a while, you know, for that to kind of finally dawn on me, but it, you know, I realized that sleep was that missing factor that I was not paying attention to. I certainly was not prioritizing. <laughs> and right. my wife told me years before, Hey, you're kind of grouchy. You're this or that. You're not your normal self. And, and it was really just because I was missing that sleep portion. I was like your Marine, you know, uh, patients, if you will, I was eating really well. I was exercising like crazy. You know, I was super fit, muscular, all the things, but my sleep was not optimized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I couldn't I mean, cheat the system. I thought I could, but you can't cheat the system. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a there's a couple of interesting uh, a couple of interesting things in there. So, um, what one of one of the, did you ever hear of the bunker trials? No, uh, I'm not familiar okay, with that. So Please share. That is one is one of William Dement's first big things, right? So yeah. it was all it was all college students. Um, and what they did is they put they put them in a cold they put them in a in a World War II bunker, right? So it was just like this cold dark room. Um, okay. and, uh, all they, they had a bed and they had like something approximating a toilet, I think kind of a bucket with a toilet lid on or whatever. And <laughs> it was college students and it was during the summer. And they said, uh, you know, we're going to pay you to do this research, obviously, but, uh, we're going to lock you in this room for 14 hours a day. And we're going to let you out for 10 hours a day. And we're just going to see what happens to sleep cycles. And so there's no light in the room. Uh, it, there's nothing for them to read. There's nothing for them to do. They were just, and this like 65 degree cool dark room and what happened when they when they first started the average student was sleeping 12 and a half hours 
And then over the course of about three to five weeks, everybody fleshed out around eight hours of sleep, give or take like 30 minutes, which means that they were sitting in a cold, dark room with nothing to do way before cell phones or anything like that, right? Just sitting there with nothing to do for six hours a day and not sleeping. So he said, these people are sleep adapted, right? So we know now that they're getting as much sleep as they need. And then they've done lots of carry-on trials with similar things. And I think they might've done a little bit of this, but you take some, you take somebody who's sleep adapted and then you say, come in tomorrow morning, come into the lab tomorrow morning, and I'm going to teach you a skill. Or I can even test you on, on something that you're already skilled at. Like if you're an athlete or musician or whatever, I can, whatever. So it doesn't matter if you're, if you're teaching it or just practicing something they already know, but, uh, you know, let's say I'm going to teach you to type with just your left hand or, you know, uh, reaction time, green, blue lights flashing, whatever, um, some kind of simple task. I'm going to test you on it. And then, uh, and then I want you to come back later tonight, uh, but, you know, and you're going to test on it again and then come back the next morning, we'll test and we'll train again. Right. And so you probably know what happens when they come back in the evening, they're worse than they were worse than they left their training so they train for an hour they reach a certain level of proficiency you test them at the end of that hour they come back at seven o'clock at night they're like 30 percent worse but once they go home and go to sleep with no additional training they come back the next day better and an interesting aside if you throw a nap in the middle of the day they perform just as though they have gone home and slept so if you get about a 45 minute nap and you come back and test at 7 p.m they test just like they went home and slept and then when they go home and sleep and they come back the next day they test the same again so you're learning twice as fast uh that's a, a tangent though um and so they did yeah. this uh, did this first series and then they said all right now we're going to take away two hours of sleep and you're going to short sleep because you're six hours you're going to come in you're going to uh train and test in the morning and then they would say, how do you think you did? And they would say, I was tired. I did, I did bad. I did, I did worse. I know <laughs> yeah. I did worse. And they'd be like, yes, right on. And then day two, same thing. Day three, maybe the same thing. But by day four, 100% of the participants said, I've completely adapted this. And I think I did as well as I've ever done. And they hold it up and go, nope, still going down. You're still going, <laughs> like you're still getting worse at the same rate. <laughs> And they, and they argue with the argue with the researchers. Uh. You don't know what you're talking about. You measured it wrong. I know. Um, and and, and they've <laughs> borne, this is borne out in, in studies uh, with, you know, in comparison to alcohol too, right? So uh, they've done a lot of work sort of, uh, um, if, what would it be, uh, equilibrating, equilib uh, equivocating? I don't know. Uh, comparing uh, blood alcohol level and sleep deprivation. And so mm -hmm. when you've been awake mm -hmm. for 18 hours, you perform like coordination wise skills, test, problem solving, uh, uh, you know, whatever math skills, uh, whatever you want to test people on. Of course, it, we all know performance diminishes as you, as you get intoxicated. So 18 hours is about a 0.5, uh, 24 hours is about, a, or I'm sorry, not 0 0.5, <laughs> 0 0.05, uh, uh, 20, 24 hours is uh, around the limit for drinking and driving. It's like 0.08 to 0.1, something like that. Uh, being awake for uh, 36 hours, you know, puts you up at like the 0.15 level. Being awake for 48 hours is like 0.2, which you pretty much have to be an alcoholic to get that drunk and be uh, and be <laughs> awake, still walking you know? and talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and so. But you do the same thing with alcoholic or not alcohol so with these people in alcohol trials. And you say, you know, they do like driving test or coordination test, or whatever. And they ask them, how do you do? How do you? And the, and the drunker they get, they think they're doing fine. <laughs> so that part <laughs> correlates really well too. And then I'll, I'll say one more thing. And I, I think this is William Dement as well. Um, although I'm not, I'm, I'm not that sure on this, but it, uh, it, if you look, if you look it up, it, it was, it was called, uh, the couple's trial or the cup, the couple study trial, just put in that in sleep. If you want to look it up, but, um, they did something very similar. So they took, they took sleep adapted couples that monogamous couples, I think, I think all of them were married, but maybe not, but definitely long-term relationships, people who knew each other really well, lives were intermeshed. And they said, Hey, we want you to do this research trial with us. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to give you 
we're going to take care of everything you need taken care of. You need child care. We'll take care of that. You need somebody to, like whatever you need. We'll do that. We'll give you some money. And we want you and your spouse to just go out and have a great day. And the only caveat is at the end of the day, we want you to come back. We're going to put you in separate rooms and we're going to ask you some questions. And they said, okay. Uh, and so they got, they, they get this trial together and then they throw in this caveat at the end. Well, you know, we're going to short sleep one of you. Right. And so <laughs> one, one of the couple, one of the people in the couple gets six hours of sleep and the other one gets eight hours of sleep. Um, and then they go about their day. They have their great day together. And you think about how great that would be. No responsibilities. And this is all on somebody else's bill should be a pretty <laughs> damn good day. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and so then they come back at the end of the day, they put them in separate rooms and they ask them questions and it doesn't matter which one of them was sleep deprived. They both say the same thing about the other. They both say he wasn't quite as present. He wasn't quite as affectionate. He wasn't quite as communicative. Like uh, he's just a little off. I didn't feel the connection that I usually feel, but pr not terrible, but it, it noticeable. And so I mean, it, to you talking about like your wife saying that you got grouchy, I mean, she, you, you were probably an unbearable prick by the time she said that to you. Like she picked <laughs> up on it immediately that you weren't quite, you weren't quite as connected, you know, but by the time <laughs> she finally needed to tell you you were grumpy, like you, you're way down that track. And I, and, yeah. and, you know, I'm obviously now I'm not being critical. I spent, you know, 15 years of my life sleeping five hours a night too, you know, because I worked all through college. Like I said, was married, had kids, uh, worked through college and then, uh, you know, then had medical school and residency and all that. And I was sleeping like five hours a night, uh, cause I, yeah. I was tough and I didn't need to sleep any more than that. Cause I was go get it. You know? <laughs> and once I learned what I now know about sleep, I was like, Oh man, if I had that, if I had that to do over again, whew, <laughs> like, what, what couldn't you have at that point? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I, I, I love that you shared that, uh, that data behind it, because I think most of us have seen that happen in our lives, whether we're the ones that are short sleeping or our spouse or somebody we know, <laughs> or, you know, right. and the, um, I think what was really interesting that you shared was that after the, I think this was the bunker trial that you were sharing that after a couple of nights, that person, I'll just say that person was me for years, yeah. I convinced myself that I could do everything I needed to do and I could do it well off of those five or six hours of sleep. But like you appropriately chimed in my wife, she knew better. She knew otherwise. She noticed that. <laughs> Although in yeah. my mind, I was I was like, what's the uh, observer's problem? What's my wife's problem? Right, I'm fine. Right. Like I'm doing everything. I'm, I'm working 12 plus hours a day. I'm still surfing every day. I'm still coming home for dinner. Like I can do all these things. And yet she... Yeah. <laughs> She was the better, better source of what was really happening. She could see that, yeah, I was grouchy. I was not myself. I was, but we kind of fake it somehow in our minds. We, we think that we're doing it all just fine. But yet in the end, I mean, you, you said this a few minutes ago and this sleep deprivation, not only do you die younger, but I think it's even classified as a potential carcinogen. Those that have shift work, like me for many years, I don't do a lot of it anymore. I still do occasionally have to work overnight and yeah. I hate it. I yeah. try to prepare for it as best I can. Um, what would you say, you mentioned yeah. this briefly, and I just love your take on the whole nap thing. What, what my uh, sort of uh, experience has been that power naps can be effective. And you mentioned the study where they did let them sleep about 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, but you probably shouldn't go much longer than that. If you take it longer than an hour or so, you typically have less, um, you know, of a benefit. Has that been your experience as well through, through uh, the, yeah. Uh, so I, I think, I think if you're sleeping well, that's probably, that's probably about as much as you need. If you're using yeah. it as a, as a mitigation, like a tool <laughs> okay. for like shift work or, you okay. know, you're just not. You know, because we know that there's reality. There's there's the ideal yeah. way to live your life, and <laughs> yeah. there's reality. And then, like in here, you need to do some stuff to mitigate, right? Mm -hmm. So, actually, an alum of ours, uh, a, a PhD named Sarah Mednick, she wrote she wrote a book. She's a sleep researcher at UCSD. Um, she wrote a book called "Take a Nap," and uh, <laughs> and she compiled all the data on naps. And it was it's really fascinating because not only so like I I work with like UFC fighters sometimes or mm -hmm. uh, you know MMA fighters some some in different leagues too, but. Uh, so if they're like really trying to hone a skill, like they're trying to cram six or eight weeks worth of boxing, if they're wrestlers or vice versa, whatever, um, 
like they, those guys will take multiple naps because they'll learn they'll learn faster right so they'll train in the morning they'll take a nap they'll train in the afternoon they'll take a nap they'll train again go home and sleep that and those and the, and that definitely accelerates learning and that's borne out in her book and what what the gestalt of the research says and we all know that you know just like nutrition just like exercise there's variability in this but sort of the mm -hmm. the gestalt of it was that you know, somewhere between a 15 and 20 minute nap restores uh, creativity, which you probably heard the stories of Edison and uh, uh, George Washington, I think, like taking these little power naps and, you know, and they're very creative guys. Um, and then you get, you know, kind of past that 20, 25 minute uh, up to about a 45 minute and you're getting the creativity. You're also getting uh, executive functioning in. Uh, but if you like you if you are sleep deprived you can do a full sleep cycle right so you talk about like 90 yeah. minutes uh definitely no definitely not two hours or more like at 120 minutes it's considered sleep and it's going to interfere with your sleep you shouldn't wake up from a nap any closer than three hours from your bedtime uh <laughs> you know longer nap probably much earlier um but she this book has a really fascinating uh, wheel on it. And I've used it with a lot of clients because, you know, as you talked about, uh, even though we know shift work is a type 2A carcinogen, people got to fly at night. Cops got to fight crime at night. We got a military, like, you know, it, it's, it's a fact of life. Like some people have to work at night. And so we do what yeah. we can to mitigate. Um, and so I work, I've worked with some clients uh, around this and she has this little dial on this book and you, it's on the cover. Uh, you have to kind of read the book to understand it, but and it's a it's a thin book. I highly recommend it. it, it you can read the thing in like an hour and a half. Um, and, and it's mainly just a compilation of the research and a summary of kind of the research for each topic. Um, and you can you know, basically dial in what time you woke up and what you're trying to optimize. You're trying to optimize creativity, executive functioning, your physical performance. And it'll tell you at what time in the day to take a nap and how long for that to be. And, and again, that's you know, we know it's not as scientific as that, but that that gets you in the neighborhood and you can kind of figure it out from there. Um, so, you know, definitely, um, you know, like I'm not a <laughs> like I'm not an advocate of polyphasic sleep or anything as it's, it's crazy as that. But, um, you know, when when people have jobs and they just don't get enough sleep, I, I say definitely nap. Uh, if you do sleep well most of the time and then you don't sleep well for a night like you you lose two or three hours of sleep i usually even recommend my clients like don't even don't even work don't even think about training that day that's going to be counterproductive you're running around like you you haven't recovered from yesterday and you're running around with mm -hmm. high stress hormones like stay active for sure of course like being active is is healthy that's that's a you know that's a hormesis you know you stress that's not going to cause you any problem but don't don't train to don't train with the intention of getting better because you haven't recovered yet <laughs> from yesterday and like go home and get a good night's sleep and then, and then do that. You know? Yeah. No, you're not going to be setting any PRs right after you are significantly sleep deprived. And, That's certainly. And, and you happening. can't, and some people do, and then they convince themselves uh, that I PR'd and I don't need as much sleep. Uh, and we know what's happening, right? What's happening is they're waking up with so many stress hormones and then they're going into you know, they're going into like an early morning training session or something and they're just they're whacked out on their caffeine and their stress hormones and yeah they do great but it's all <laughs> catabolic like they're you like they're destroying their body to do it and it takes a while to catch on to that because as we said the self-awareness goes away and at some yeah. point <laughs> it, at some point you're right right because like if i sleep and, I, and like i said i've done this too just like you if i sleep you know five or six hours a night for a month, that is the new me. That is normal, <laughs> right? And it's like well, this is this is who I am. This is how I think, and this is how I perform. It's not optimal me, but it's, yeah, it's not new optimal, me, exactly. and, it's, and that's what I'm used to. And so it's you know it's like when you do hormone replacement therapy on somebody, and, and their their hormones have been shot for 20 years. Like they come back to you after a month, they're like, "Oh my god." I can't believe I used to feel like this. This is so amazing. I can't, right? And then they come back a month later and they say, oh no, now I feel, and then it takes like three months for them to go, Jesus, was I messed up? I had no idea I was that far gone. And I find like when I, and you know, most of my private clients, um, you know, they're, they're, 
they're men who've traded their health for wealth for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And they've been burning the candle at both ends and they're hard charging entrepreneurs, C-level executives, whatever. And and now they have a ton of money. They don't care about money. And they just want to be healthy again. And uh, <laughs> the the one intervention they're the most resistant to is sleeping. But once mm -hmm. I get the once I get them sleeping well for even a week, they're like, oh my god, <laughs> the world's so much brighter. The colors are so much so much brighter. <laughs> like I notice things I've never noticed, like stoplights, and you know, like uh, I mean, they, like their whole their whole life shifts just from getting good sleep for a week. And then, you know, you carry that, you carry that out and the difference, you know, once you've kind of, and of course we know like you, you have failed to repair, you have failed to flush out beta amyloid and tau and things like, and you have damaged yourself to some degree irreparably uh, that we're not going to get back, but you still get, uh, you know, you still get a, a very big boost and people are like, I can't believe that I, that I, I, drudge through that and i'm the same way like what once i learned what i learned about sleep and so well maybe i should and and of course <laughs> like any healthcare provider i was lecturing the seals on what to do for a year before i started doing it myself right <laughs> and when i finally it's like maybe i should do this too maybe it applies to me and uh you know and then i was just like oh my god what was i thinking like i could look back at decisions i'd made six months ago and just be like what was i thinking like what like <laughs> That is a, that is stupid. Like I'm not, like I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm not stupid, and that's a stupid <laughs> decision. And why did I do that? Like I wasn't under the influence of drugs. I was just chronically sleep deprived. And yeah. and another thing that uh, I wanted to point out, I, I didn't get to when when I was talking about that alcohol correlation. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, I don't stay up 24 hours. I don't stay up 36 hours. I don't stay up 48 hours." <laughs> we got you. Uh, so there was a, there was a study where they just took away they short slept people and then mm -hmm. they and then they correlated it to the to the, being awake for twenty four hours and thirty six hours and forty eight hours. So uh, if you sleep six hours a night for eleven days, you perform just like you've been up for twenty four hours, right? And you perform like that all day, every day. You do that for <laughs> twenty two days, and you start performing like you haven't been like you haven't slept for forty eight hours, and that's. And that's what they're talking about there is like executive, executive functioning skills, coordination, endurance, power, and things like that. Um, and then it kind of plateaus somewhere around, you know, 20, you know, 24 to 30 kind of days around a month. And it plateaus, except your error rate, your error rate will continue to get, to get worse. Like, and you'll just think <laughs> I'm getting older. I'm not as sharp, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, you are getting older and you're getting older a lot faster uh, than you should yeah. because you aren't sleeping enough, <laughs> but uh, but the error rate keeps climbing to infinity and it is a fascinating trial. And then they did it with four hours of sleep and, you know, and it happens 30 to 40% faster, but the plateau seems to be right around the same place. So it's not like you'll just continue to decline into where you're like, you know, homeless street vegan or street vegan <laughs> or something, you know, but you like, you'll, you'll kind of plateau at a bad place and that'll just be the new you. And you'll just think that that's normal. It's, it's normal to be this tired. It's normal to hurt this much. It's normal to, um, you know, we didn't even get into much with the hormones about, you know, appetite regulation that's set while you're asleep. Right. Mm -hmm. And like I said, only, the only other animal that sleep deprives them. the only time other animals sleep deprives themselves is when they're under threat. And so it's very, very reasonable to think that we have some evolutionary mechanisms in our head to say the same, same thing. And so when we wake up in the next day, our body's like, Hey, we're going into famine. We need a lot of sugar to fuel yeah. the brain and any fat you can get, we can store that. So like, let's do lots of sugar and lots of fat and your app and, you know, and of course the ghrelin appetite regulation, the fat, the, le the leptin, the fat regulation, and your body's going to store as much fat and you're going to crave as much food and you crave sugar and fat. And so the American diet, right? <laughs> You fry, <laughs> you fry some sugar, call that a donut, and then you know, <laughs> take in some caffeine to block all that adenosine that's in your brain, and now you feel yeah. good to go. You know, uh, so it makes sense when when you kind of, you know, 
learn learn yeah. all the little nooks and crannies and you're like oh that explains that kind of explains that it's, it's all hormones yeah it's all hormones yeah. there is a mechanism i'd love to hear your thoughts on jet lag i know you've probably had lots of experience with it yourself um yeah you've worked with a lot of people not only you know shift workers and the like but when you're moving across time zones what are your biggest tips or, or pearls to help somebody kind of get in sync with the new time zone and try to avoid jet lag what are, what what would you say yeah so i mean <laughs> The, the only thing that's practically that practically works for me and uh I you know I know there's some enter lab gadgetry that that people have <laughs> postulated um but but basically we know like we we just we just know the way it is it's like it it takes one to it takes one to two days to cap to recapture one time zone depending mm -hmm. on which direction you're going right um and so it's it's obviously harder to pull your bedtime closer than it is to push your bedtime out farther away. So, um, so you can figure that out. And so what I tell people, because it, it, it gets so complex when you start trying to calculate the sun and all this, if you can prepare ahead of time, fine, uh, you can minimize it. But if you're going to travel six time zones and be there for two days and come back, you're not going to re-regulate. <laughs> like that's not, it's yeah. not possible. Like there's not enough time to do it. So what I tell, I just, I get people this very s simple, basic things. It's like, you have, you only, you only have a, a couple of realistic tools. <laughs> of course, when the sun goes down the blue light, we know all that pathway melatonin secretes, tons mm -hmm. of changes, GABA saturates the brain, lowers the resting potential, makes it harder to interact with the world. You can overcome that GABA pressure um, with light you, because you're blocking melatonin, but you can also overcome that with exercise and activity. You can just push past it. Like when you're dead tired after work and your friend talks you into going to happy hour and all of a sudden you have a beer or two and you're not sleepy anymore. Well, that's just because you've stimulated yourself. Right. So you know, the only real tools you have is to like is light and stimulation. And so obviously if you do the bright light early in the morning, you do the exercise early yeah. in the morning, you can bring your bedtime towards you. And then if, you, you know, and if you're going to be tired really early in the day, given the times on your end, you, then you put that towards the end of the day. You give yourself an extra mm -hmm. boost of bright light therapy, 20 to 30 minutes, 10,000 lux or more. However you do that, you probably do it with the sun. Most places you go do your workouts uh, kind of later in the evening, get your cortisol stress hormones kind of up and push that bedtime out further. But those are they're really the only two practical applications. And you can do the same thing beforehand. You can of course supplement with melatonin because, but don't try to supplement with melatonin with bright lights in your eyes because you're it's a mixed <laughs> message to your brain, right? Yeah, so yeah. block block the blue light early, take the melatonin early, and you can you can pull that bedtime closer to you that way. Um, the supplement, you know, that that uh, all that combination of of supplements that I gave the seals, I eventually like made a product out of mm -hmm. that and called it Doc Parsley Sleep Cocktail, which yeah. was a terrible name. Rob's actually an investor in that company. And uh, uh, it turned out to be like blocked from firewalls at governments and schools and stuff because it had the word cocktail. Gotta take in the it. Co and cocktail. <laughs> half my clients were putting it in their cocktails, thinking that uh. it was, like, no, no, no. <laughs> so anyways, we changed it to sleep remedy, but um, yeah, like that, that product's the same way. Um, like that's all the constituent elements to make melatonin and then two micrograms of melatonin to get things started. So uh, I always caution people, like if you're doing melatonin just for jet lag and you're doing it here and there, whatever, take a milligram, you're fine. But you know, if you're taking even a milligram a night, and a lot of people are taking five or 10 or 15 milligrams a night, you will downregulate melatonin production or melatonin receptors for sure. We don't know about melatonin, but if it doesn't downregulate, it's the only hormone in the body that doesn't. So it probably does. We just haven't proven yet. <laughs> um, yeah. So um so like uh, my product is just, you know, because tryptophan becomes five hydro five hydroxy tryptophan, you need vitamin D3 and magnesium to make serotonin. Serotonin becomes melatonin. That's what's in my product, like just, mm -hmm. just supporting that pathway. So um those types of things, like I'm not, I'm not trying to shuck my product here, but you can people can go online and look at that. Like those those are that's how melatonin is made. And then you can get some benefit from GABA to kind of help settle the brain down because those really the only three things you need to go to sleep decrease the blue light change the chemistry in the brain gaba saturates slows down your interaction with the world your body temperature drops like those are the, that's all sleep hygiene and in, in three sentences right um so yeah. 
those, those are kind of the tools. Those are the tools you have to work with. You can lower your body temperature a little bit. You can, you can, a lot of people think they need a cold shower. You just need a shower because yeah, you know, your body's 98 degrees. <laughs> Very few people take a 99 degree shower. Like, you know, you're going to take an 85 <laughs> degree shower or something. Uh, and I wouldn't do like an ice cold thing because you're going to, you're going to, well, that's going to increase the cortisol for a little yeah. bit. I mean, it's a hormetic stressor, yeah. right? It's going <laughs> to, yeah. you don't probably yeah. want to do that right before you go to yeah. bed in the same, same vein. You don't want to do hit training right before you go to bed. <laughs> yeah, it's like... Right. Right. <laughs> you can do that hit training. If it, if you feel like going to bed and you need to stay up for two more hours, you need to stay yeah. up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do that then and push that bedtime further out. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's so key. And I think the thing I underappreciated for many years was that early morning light. Um, I've yeah. done tons of travel as well. And I've worked across multiple time zones for a while. I was flying from Hawaii to Florida. And so depending on what time of the year, that's six time zones. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. I'd have to be sharp and be able to be at the hospital for 12 or 24 hours after having, you know, flown across six different time zones. And, and the light factor was probably the most helpful, useful thing for me was <laughs> just kind of yeah. getting that early morning light making sure I got enough uh, exposure to that bright light. And if I needed to, you know, stay up longer, same thing, get the bright light in me and also exercising, try to push that, uh, push that bedtime a little later if I needed to. Um, but I think those yep. are the two most helpful things, especially the light. And I think a lot of people underappreciate that, that the the bright light of the morning, the first, you know, two hours or so earlier, the better. If you can get out there, not sunglasses, just have your eyeballs, you know, seeing the light as right. the sun's coming up. Like that's one of the most important things to setting your circadian clock. So you get that amazing good night's sleep and it's free. It's simple. Yeah. It's free. It's powerful. I mean, those are the two biggest cues, right? That, that we have is basically the light. And then the other one we haven't even talked about, but is, is food, right? If we're eating a right. big meal close to the end of the day, and then we're trying to go to sleep, we may fall asleep quicker right in the beginning, but we're going to wake up two or three hours later and be like, Oh yeah. crap, I need a little yeah. snack or something because, <laughs> because right. of the whole process of digestion. We might have a little bit of postprandial hypoglycemia waking us up, whatever that is. Like if we can yeah. adjust our wake times to coordinate with whatever time zone we're in with the light and also eating during the times where it's light and then not eating late at night, like those for me have been the biggest yeah. game changers. I do tend to take uh, melatonin when I'm traveling because sometimes I just need that extra yeah. little bit. <laughs> yeah. But, and like uh, I said, I, if you're if you're taking that you know, 20 or 30 days a year, like the, uh, whatever, like that's not a big thing, but you know, I, of course you, know, I'm sure you've met people who I take 15 milligrams every night and a half for five years. It's like, boy, you screwed. That's, if a, big, ever... that's a big dose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I once went into GNC and I saw a bottle of 50 milligram melatonins and I was like, wow, wow. What are you doing with that? Wow. Can you get high off that 50. or what? Like, <laughs> like that seems insane. Um, but wow. yeah, there was a book, there's a book out and it was kind of, it was about how it was melatonin is a great antioxidant. You yeah, can take yeah. it and have this full body stuff. And so people were taking kind of crazy dosage. Giant of that. doses but, for sure. Uh, what, what you're saying about the light therapy. Um, so it was kind of when I was in all of this with the seals, uh, a book came out called chronotherapy. So it's like, it's like mm -hmm. circa 2011, 2012, something like that. And um, it was, you know, it, it was a, a multi-centered uh, book. So I want to say it was like Oxford and Harvard kind of collaborated mm. on it, but um, it, it was really sort of the beginning. I mean, chronotherapy had been going for about four or five years at that time. And they talked about kind of the beginning cases that made them aware of this. So they were working with inpatients and a psych ward. Mm. Mm. And there were people who had been inpatients for 10 years and dependent upon psychiatric medication that they completely cured with chronotherapy getting them out in the morning and getting them on walks and getting their circadian rhythms aligned and getting their nutrition aligned with their circadian rhythms and getting them active and these people went from you know being drooling vegetables and as an inpatient to a completely functionally normal person on no medication whatsoever <laughs> and i read that and i was like whoa this is way more powerful than i realized <laughs> you know and and yeah. Yeah, i mean i'm sure you've experienced the same things like everything you learn about sleep and you know there's an infinite amount of information i mean we're it's such a young field in science and everything i learned about sleep i'm like geez like i didn't know like i can't believe that too and that like it's honestly the worst it, it's the you know, it's the worst sales pitch in the world right is that my product does everything 
but it does like sleep does everything it makes you better yeah. at everything it helps you repair like it anything you care about sleep is important for that and like it makes you better at anything you care about um and it and it just continually fascinates me like every like it seems like every couple of months i read something I'm like geez and that too oh and that too oh and and it, it's unquestionably the most important facet of our lives. I mean, I used when I first started lecturing, I said, you know, there's four pillars of health: there's sleep, nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation. Mm -hmm. And I, in the last five years, I've changed my lecture, and I was like, there's three pillars of health: there's nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation, and they sit on the platform of sleep. And if you don't sleep, it doesn't matter. The other pillars yeah. can't stand; like they have to have that foundation of sleep. <laughs> and, and and we know that because like. Your like just your appetite regulation and your fuel partitioning changes when you don't sleep well. So yeah. there goes your diet. Even though you're eating well, your body's going to do different stuff with it, and you're going to need way more willpower, which you aren't going to have because your prefrontal not, cortex yeah. is going to be impaired with the cortisol. You know your exercise. You're not you. You don't like we said earlier. You don't get stronger when you exercise. You get stronger when you sleep. Right. You repair better. <laughs> so if I lift more weights than I can lift today, my body tries to my brain and body try to make it to where I can do that tomorrow. If I try it again by making those muscles a little thicker, a little thicker, the actin heads a little stronger, like whatever it's doing, <laughs> or mitochondria for my endurance or whatever. Like my body's going to try to compensate and make me better at that. Uh, and you know, it, you, you, you don't do that. Like you don't sleep well and you don't get that repair. So why are you exercising? Like, you're not going to get better. Just stay active. So you don't kill yourself, but like, you're not going to get better at anything. So exercise really isn't that practical for you if you aren't recovering from it. And then stress mitigation is out the window because now you're doing the stress mitigation tools just to bring you back down to where you were, where you were when you started your stress training, because your stress hormones are so much higher because you're sleep deprived. So, I mean, there's yeah. nothing that compares to it. Like uh, every, everything else is dependent upon sleep and, and the, and the, you know, the other side's true, like nutrition affects your sleep and stress affects your sleep and your exercise affects your sleep. But I'd say they're, it's about 30, 70 to 30, like 70% yeah. to 30%. Yeah, no, nothing can take the place of or or sort of overpower the need for sleep. I mean, sleep. I love right. how you put it now at the base of <laughs> put the yeah. other three on top, and it, those those don't matter that much if you're not getting a good night's sleep. And I wouldn't have agreed with you 20 years ago, but now I 100. Yeah. percent I, I have you know witnessed personally in my own life that not only am I a better human, according to my wife, I I just <laughs> feel better. I mean, I, yeah. I I do feel better. I perform better. I I'm just enjoying life more. And I I never thought I would say this because I was always of the mindset that every hour you're sleeping, you're missing something. Right? It was right. ingrained in me in yeah. med school and residency, all those things. And I wanted to do you know so many things, and sleep was just I can't waste a third of my life that way but turns out as yeah. you said you'll die younger anyway so it's it's going to yeah. be the equalizer no matter what you might as well live each and every day thriving and it's just hard to do that without proper sleep and so sleep is my new superpower i've been paying attention to it for about a decade and i just i agree with my wife i think i'm a better human because of it yeah yeah <laughs> we can't, I, we can't I mean, neglect it <laughs> i I, de I definitely enjoy my life better i mean i enjoy my life way more and and now because I, it's been a priority of my life for, you know, I don't know, about the same as you, about a decade, a, a little more, like 12, maybe 12 years or so. Uh, like I, you know, I can't even handle sleep deprivation now. <laughs> you know, I like, wouldn't want to go I, back. I, yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> I, like I couldn't, I couldn't last a week of what I used to do. Like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Rob, Rob Wolf talked me into to go on paleo. Uh, we've yeah. been friends for years and I was like, I don't have any GI problems, you know, and I'm, yeah. and I'm a fairly yeah. lean guy. I'm a muscular guy. I'm athletic. Like, I don't really have any problems. Why? Like, why do I need, he's like, Come on, you'll feel better. I promise you'll feel better. And I was like, whatever. And so, you know, I did this paleo thing the way he told me to. And I, I can't remember how long you did it, like six months, a year or something. And I was like, I don't know that I noticed anything wrong. Like, <laughs> like maybe, maybe I feel a little bit better, but then now I can't handle gluten whatsoever. Like ever since then, it's just like, but, used to be able to eat anything you wanted to that's gone so so it saved me in the end because now like yeah you know, i just i can't handle anything i can't handle anything processed at all really yeah. i mean any, your food quality that, has improved anyway so yeah and so <laughs> can thank yeah. him for that <laughs> yeah yeah so that's I'll, awesome I'll, I'll end up living longer and being healthier because of his advice yeah yeah, yeah. well 
Well, I, I know we're, we're getting up on time here. I just want to thank you uh, for being here with us today, sharing these pearls of wisdom and your experience. And I just want to give you a chance, uh, Dr. Parsley, to just share any sort of last kind of parting thoughts on sleep. And then, of course, where we can reach out to you, how we can grab you know, your uh, cocktail, which is now the sleep remedy, right? Doc Parsley's sleep remedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all the things, uh, any parting thoughts? Yeah, so um, I, you know, what I always tell people, the the most Im- the most important thing about getting sleep, uh, about improving your sleep, is to convince yourself that you need sleep. Right? <laughs> We're born knowing how to do it. Baby sleep right out of the right out of the womb. Yeah. Right? You know, it's like we we don't need to learn how to sleep. Uh, we do need to like we do need as adults. Uh, we do need to learn how to get stress out of our sleep. Um, and I and I I do have a guide for that. Like we my um, it, I think it's behind a paywall, but but my uh, Shayla who scheduled this, she can give it. We will give you your, your audience a link for that. Um, yeah, it's cool. basically take it take an hour to describe. It. It's basically how do you get stress out of your sleep. But um, so what I tell people is like the number one factor for getting your sleep is convincing yourself that you need to sleep. <laughs> and so go go to something reputable like uh, you know go to like, Google Scholar or PubMed or something like that and put in sleep and whatever you care about. Like, I don't, I don't care, like whatever, sleep and parenting, sleep and making money, sleep and business, sleep and sports, like I don't care, but just sleep and what you care about. And then just read until you're terrified and go, oh my God, <laughs> I'm destroying my life. And once you feel like you're destroying your life, you'll have the motivation, <laughs> you know? And like, and like I said, like, you know, the blue light, the lack of stimulation and the decrease of body temperature, that's all of sleep hygiene. You can figure out, like, you can figure out how to massage that into your life and make that practical um you can you know you can figure out how to mitigate you know uh if if you aren't getting enough sleep you know thing things you know things like napping meditation mindfulness all that stuff like all, you can learn all that like you don't need to be an expert at that but what you do need is to be convinced that it's really important and uh and I, like you 10 years ago I would have never said this but it is unquestionably the most important thing that you can do for your health longevity performance just towards working towards the future that you want the most powerful tool that you have is sleep yeah and then, well, well said the other question you asked was just uh docparsley.com is my website and all of that stuff's on there so yeah and he's he's on instagram at kirk parsley uh i had fun kind of going through all your recent posts on there and i, I love the one that and you shared this the concept today is that you can't build muscle unless you're sleeping like I got right. goals and I, you know, I'm in my 50th year of life and I want to be stronger than I ever was when I was 20. And I'm, I know that I can't do that without sleeping. <laughs> right. And you, well, you've said that there, a couple of times today. And that's that so there's cool. that old, that axiom that everybody's heard too, is like, you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. Yeah, for sure. You can't exercise your way out of bad sleep. You can't eat yep. your way out of bad sleep and you can't control your stress out of your way like you can't diminish stress and and compensate for no sleep it's like or poor sleep like poor <laughs> sleep matters more than anything like you know you 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 cannot compensate for it there is there is no magic pill there's no potion there's no there's no trick or gadget <laughs> like there's no biohack that's going to make you not need sleep you need eight hours of sleep whether you like it or not that's just the way the world is <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. You, you, the sooner you can convince yourself of that, the, the better, because yep. you have to make it a priority. Like you said, we all know how to do it. We've been doing it since uh, we came literally into this life. We could sleep really well as babies and we've kind of talked ourselves out of the importance <laughs> of it. At least I did for way too yeah, long. For sure. <laughs> so for sure. thank you for that reminder. Yeah. And, uh, We'll put all those links in the show notes. And uh, I just appreciate you taking the time to to share with us your experience, your wealth of knowledge. And I just want to say a big mahalo from all of us here at the Unshakable Health Podcast. Dr. Parsley, thanks for coming on the show. All right, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. And remember to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you never miss out. Aloha.